Sun TV. That was the making of that film was the hardest thing I ever had to do. And the great Marvin Worth bought the rights from Dr. Bey Shabazz. Way back. Way back. And for 20 something years, he tried to get it made. Several directors, several, several actors, and finally, Norma Jews was directed with, with Denzel. And when I heard that Norma Jews was directing this, I said, hell to the knob. <laughs> but here's the thing though. I respect Norman Jewish because it was his job. He gracefully bowed out. He didn't have to do that. And so once we got that, I knew we had to do the film. But from the very beginning, we didn't have enough money. We didn't have enough money. I put half my salary into the, the film. Warner Brothers knew it. We all knew it. But we're just going to go. I mean, this whole thing is, and, you know, in the studio system, you know, you got to get them, get them impregnated. So we knew one day the money would run out. And Warner Brothers did not want the length of that film to be three hours. We knew it was not about ego to tell the many different lives that Malcolm led. We needed that time. We needed that time. And we went out. We sh it's crazy. We, we, uh, we showed the four-hour version to Warner Brothers. <laughs> Four hours. We knew we to cut it down, but it was a day of the Rodney King verdict. So we're screening the film for Warner Brothers executives, the two presidents, and the, the secretaries are coming in and out because LA's burning. But to their credit, they stayed throughout the whole four hours. And so it wasn't a long discussion because they had to, we had, I think a helicopter came to Warner Brothers lot and took him to where he had to go. And they, I, they said, how long did the film be? I said, and he's the longest. I said, how long is JFK? Because JFK was coming out. Right. And they said, JFK is two hours. They didn't know I know Oliver Stone. <laughs> I call Oliver, that's Oliver. How long was, how long was JFK? He said, Spike, it's three hours, but I'm tell them, blah, blah, blah. I told you so. So we knew that we had to keep going. We, we did not cut the film, the length, and Warner Brothers let the Bond Company take over the film. All the people in post-production, got registered letters saying you're fired. As I said before, I already put half my salary already into the film. So it was the lowest point in my life, with the exception of my, my mother dying. And Malcolm came to me. Self-determination, self-reliance. I kept thinking about that again and again and again. What does that mean? And then it hit me like a ton of bricks. I know some black folks that got some money. <laughs> so this is the plan. Not that only know, but I had that phone number. So I made a list. And here's the key thing. This was not, it, it was not, they, they're not, they couldn't get any money back. It wasn't a tax write-off. Just had to be like, here, take it. Take it. And the first person I called was Bill Cosby. Called him up, said, Bill, first thing I said was, how's Camille? <laughs> then I told him what it was about. He said, Spike, I'll put the check in the mail. I said, nah. I knew he lived in a townhouse up east side. <laughs> Knocked on the door, didn't even come in. Snatched that check, ran to the bank before he could change his mind. So I made a list. And I always get the order mixed up. 
great woman, Peggy Cooper Kafritz. She wrote a check. Tracy Chapman. Janet Jackson. Prince. And then there were Tulip. So here's the other thing, though, is that every time I said yes, I was asked for more money. I was feeling it. So I had two people on my list called the Magic. Boom. And then the last call, the GOAT, who was born in Fort Greene, Brooklyn, not North Carolina, Michael Jordan, born in Cumberland Hospital on Myrtle Avenue. Same hospital Mike Tyson and Bernard King were born. Bernard and Albert King were born. So, if you one thing about Michael, he don't like to lose nothing. Very competitive. So I just let it slip how much magic gave. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I feel, Miss Open Winfrey. Sorry, sorry. She's in there. I, I tell you, I get, I get the. So I let. I led Michael. I said, well, Magic gave. He said, Magic gave what? <laughs> Boom. <laughs> so now we had the money, and I had the money to rehire the crew. And at this time, there was no, con no talking between myself and Warner Brothers, because Warner Brothers gave the film to the Bond company. So. On this date, on Malcolm's birthday, we had a press conference at the Schomburg Collection, Schomburg Library, 135th and Lenox, and we announced that these prominent African Americans wrote these checks. And the next day, Warner Brothers financed the rest of the movie. Wow. True story. And the movie is because of Denzel Washington. Denzel had done an off-Broadway play when Chickens, Chickens Come Home to Roost many years. And there were many times when he was on camera that our skin was crawling because we saw Malcolm. It was eerie. It was eerie. And there's one scene, all the speeches were Malcolm's speeches, and there's one scene where you see uh, Al Freeman Jr. as Arnold, Arnold, Arnold Elijah Muhammad behind him. And so we're looking at this. Denzel is talking. I'm next to my great cameraman, Ernest Dickerson. And we're shooting film, so it's only 10 minutes in a roll of film. We're shooting 35 millimeter. So Denzel's going. I'm turning the page. He's killing it, killing it, killing it. And Ernest is telling me, Spike, we're about to roll out. And then I see that I'm reading the script, and this is where the scene's supposed to end. And he keeps going. <laughs> and the stuff, it, we were all mesmerized. And finally, Ernest said, we rolled out. So I went up to Denzel, and his eyes were glazed over. His eyes were glazed over. Anybody was there, we saw the spirit of Malcolm. The spirit of Malcolm came over Denzel. But here's the thing, though. Denzel, he started working on that role a year before we even began to shoot. Stop drinking, no more swine, no pork was on his fork. <laughs> We're not talking about shorty now. <laughs> but learn how to pray, read the Quran. He devoted his life to that role. So you, I'm not gonna name no names. For a lot of these autobiographical films, you could put the makeup on and the hair, but that's, that stuff is superficial. 
that performance happened because he put the work in. Denzel put the work in, and as you said, it doesn't seem like 30 years, but that performance gets better every year. And it was a great travesty that Denzel did not win the Academy Award for that role. But let me break it down to you. In basketball, there's a thing called the makeup call. Everybody know what that is? When the referee sees a call, they don't call it, and then the next time, boom. One of the greatest actors ever, Al Pacino. Give it up for Al Pacino. He, knew he got nominated, but not win for Godfather, Godfather 2, Serpico, Dog Day Afternoon. Al Pacino, he's from, he's from the Bronx too. Al Pacino's a true. So, he didn't win all those times. Denzel's young, he'll be back. He gets it. Denzel comes around again, training day, boom. But we can only, we can't, here's the thing as an artist. You cannot allow other people to determine. You know what I'm talking about, sister. You know what I'm talking about. We can't let other artists determine what our worth is. So, in closing, I'm honored to be here. And uh, we all love, oh, last thing. <laughs> this is for you, my sister, Ms. Shabazz. You, listen, uh oh, you, what does that mean? You took your glasses off. Hmm? Okay, it's about your mother. During the pre-production of this film, I had several conversations with your mother. And she's responsible for, one, for the, the best, the best, one of the best scenes in the film. Ernest Dickerson, great cameraman. Ernest and I, he went to Howard, H, you know. We came in NYU film school together. He went to Howard, he went to Morris. Boom, Ernest shot all my films at NYU. She's gonna have a school day, do the right thing, more better, Jungle Fever, than Malcolm X. And we, had, we had doing this thing called the double dolly shot, where it looks like someone's floating. And so before we did Malcolm X, Ernest and I said, we have to, we just can't be using that stuff to show off. We've been out of film school many years. We have to have a reason to use that shot. And Dr. Betty Shabazz told me that she felt her husband knew he was going to be assassinated right here. She told me that. And when Dr. Bishop Bass told me that, that's when I knew. That's where the double dolly shot had to be. You know the scene, Sam Cooke. What's he singing? Change of the Come. He, that's how that scene came to be. Dr. Bishop Bass, thank you. Good night. <laughs>